<laughs> well, good evening, everyone. Good oh, evening. Hi. I'm Ann Harrison. I'm the hi, Dean Anne. of Berkeley Haas. Uh, and I'd like to welcome, welcome you to tonight's hi. Dean Speaker Series. Um, so I have the privilege of introducing you. Uh, our speaker, very well known. We've never had this venue as packed as it is tonight, Jensen Huang. So Jensen founded NVIDIA in 1993. He's served since its inception as president, chief executive officer, and a member of the board of directors. NVIDIA is said to be the world's last computer graphics company to have been founded, but with Jensen's diligence and perseverance, NVIDIA survived and outstripped the competition. I'm going to skip all, most of the accolades, but I will point out that oh, Jensen. No, that's the <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, just I won't kidding. skip them. Uh, Jensen has <laughs> received. Really <laughs> Jensen. No, no, this is going to be excruciating. <laughs> no, no. Well, we'll Please do the short me. version. Okay, um, thank you. Jensen has received numerous awards, including the Semiconductor Industry Association's highest honor, the Robert N. Noyce Award, IEEE Founders Medal, and the Dr. Morris Chang Exemplary Leadership Award. He's been named the world's best CEO by Harvard Business Review and Brand Finance, as well as Fortune's Business Person of the Year, and one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People. So Jensen, thank you so much for braving that terrible ride from San Francisco. Um, thank you for taking the time to speak to us. We're sold out. The students are all very excited to hear you. Um, first, Jensen, I think you'll say a few words to our audience. And then our MBA students, Ryan Tan and Renee Yao, will moderate today's discussion. What, what, to, what to say? Um, well, I, I thought everything that was most important to say, she, she did so nicely say. <laughs> uh, first of all, thanks for the introduction, and it's great to be here. Uh, I, am, I am now, I think, the longest running tech CEO uh, working today. I've been working in tech for 30 years. Uh, this is a, it's a, it, it's a incredibly, incredibly fun job. Uh, I can tell you that, and uh, that's why, why I do it. Um, it is a it is a incredibly uh, um, uh, incredibly good job for, and it's a, it's a privilege to do it. Uh, you're surrounded by amazing people. Uh, in our case, we had the benefit of pioneering a new way of doing computing. Uh, this new way of doing computing has solved uh, and is solving some of the world's greatest challenges. Uh, we're really pleased to be. Uh, working in digital biology to climate sciences to artificial intelligence to robotics to video games. Um, uh, just if you wouldn't mind, how many of you uh, have played video games on NVIDIA GeForce? And so I want to I want to thank you for that. And how many of you are are uh, uh, AI researchers or or uh, developers that have used our GPUs for you know developing AI models? That's really terrific. So it's great to see that. Uh, it, it is it is a, a rare privilege to be part of a company uh, that that isn't just a good business. Nvidia is good business for sure, um, but it's a good business that also makes a great impact on the world. And the work that you do is really important to other people. And so, so um, uh, the combination of of uh, running a, a good business uh, and the skills of doing that, uh, I had to learn along the way. Uh, the the, um, uh, the a purpose of a company that that could make such great impact on on the industry and um, uh, markets around the world and and uh, and society is is a great privilege, and then also to have done something that the world's never done before and do it for the first time. You know, singularly the, the company that invented this field of computing, uh, it, it's it's just incredible incredible fun, and so hopefully uh, hopefully tonight we'll. Um, uh, we'll get to share uh, some of the, the learnings that I've, I've uh, gained along the way. Uh, I didn't have the benefit you did, which is which is learning uh, a business uh, in, in a formal way. I learned business in the way of, of doing it. And uh, all along the way, uh, uh, I discovered and realized that, that there was a lot to learn. Uh, some of the some of the things that some of the things that I've learned along the way, uh, I try to pass along to uh, all the leaders of our company. 
Um, but this is, this is uh, the business part of our company, the strategy part of our company is some of the hardest things that we do. And the reason for that is it's so ambiguous. And, and uh, it's not just about what you do, uh, it's about what everybody else does in return. Uh, it's about what the competition does, it's about what the industry does, what the customers do. And so it's, a, it's an incredibly hard problem to simulate and an incredibly hard thing to, to, uh, to learn how to do. But I had the, had the benefit of, of uh, learning it over the course of 30 years. And so hopefully tonight we'll get to, get to talk about some of those things. Okay? All right. Glad, glad, glad to be here. Thank you so much, Jensen. We're all really excited for you to be here. I'm Ryan. I'm a second year MBA student, and I'm honored to co-moderate this discussion with you with Renee. Um, uh, let's get started. So our first question is on starting NVIDIA. So in the crowd, we have many aspiring tech entrepreneurs that are close in age <clears throat> when you first founded NVIDIA. Can you tell us a bit on how you came to start NVIDIA? What was the spark that led you to start this amazing journey? Do you have some advice for some of the entrepreneurs in the crowd who plan on starting their own journeys one day? Uh, whatever you do, don't start a graphics company. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, uh, NVIDIA being the last, uh, you know, I, I've, I've always said that NVIDIA was the last computer graphics company founded. Um, and that, that says something about, about um, uh, strategy. Uh, you know, we were, we were one of 100 computer graphics companies and, and also the last one founded. Uh, how is it possible that we're the largest in the world today and the only one remaining? That, that, there's, a, there's, a, there's a strategy study in there somewhere. And that suggests that, that being first is not necessarily uh, uh, the best. You could argue that being the first 99 isn't the best. And sometimes, sometimes um, being last is not necessarily even the worst. Uh, but I do hope that we are the last, um, you know, if, you, if you get what I mean. Um, the, uh, uh, the, the battle between two computer architecture approaches um, uh, over the course of time using processors on the one hand, which is general purpose, uh, writing software, that does just about anything that runs on a computer versus an acceleration method has gone on for a very long time. And about, about 30 years ago, uh, uh, Chris and Curtis, the two, two other founders of NVIDIA, uh, wanted to do something different and, and uh, they wanted me to join them. Uh, I, I was really happy with my job and, and uh, we had two great kids and a uh, great dog, and, and uh, we had a great family, and, and so I was perfectly happy doing what we were doing. Um, but they insisted I join them and, um, to do something. And so, so uh, I, we, you know, the three of us uh, met on a regular basis at Denny's, and, and then uh, we conceived of what NVIDIA is today, uh, an accelerated computing company. And, and uh, that was really as simple as the, the beginning as, as anything. I, I, don't, I don't think that that um, uh, startups need to, need to form out of extraordinary angst or you know, incredible opportunity. Um, we were three, three um, uh, good friends, and we remain good friends today. Um, and uh, uh, there, were, there was an opportunity to work together, and we had to go figure out what to do. And so, so I think that, that entrepreneurial uh, approach to solving problems, looking for opportunities, uh, persists to, to this day. You know, the, it could be a random Tuesday, and and we're trying to think of, of uh, something new to go do, or something we can do with something that we know, um, or an opportunity were to arise that we can go take advantage of, and uh, the company is reinventing itself all the time. So this this basic method of seeing problems or seeing opportunities, or just happens to be Tuesday, um, uh, creating creating something out of nothing is is a skill that I think everybody, every company, or every startup needs to have. Uh, we've, we've applied, we apply that basic method all the time. Uh, we don't have to invent ourselves, reinvent ourselves during a tough day. We don't have to reinvent ourselves because of an opportunity rise. Uh, we invent ourselves, you know, because we do. And so just uh, the, the energy of, of looking for something new um, and a new way of doing something is, is, is always, always there. 
Um, what, what, what was what, you, it? Was a <laughs> compounded question of a lot of complexity. <laughs> Sorry um, about that. <laughs> advice for entrepreneurs. The what? Advice for entrepreneurs. Advice. Um, I've only done it. You guys, know, you, I've only done it once. Uh, it, there, there's, there's something about. I, I don't want to set the expectation that you're going to get any wisely, you know, sagely advice. I've only done this once, and I'm still learning on the job. And and I, I kind of feel like that's the wisdom. There, there isn't. You know, I was no different than you guys, except less prepared. And and. Uh, Everything I did, I did on the job. Uh, I, I still remember it was um, about, about uh, February or March, 93, and it occurred to us we needed money. And, and, uh, and the place to go get it is venture capitalists, and the way you do that apparently is to write a business plan. And so I bought a book. I mean, the obvious thing to do is you buy a book. And so I bought a book, and it says, how to write a business plan. Now, back then, Back then, how to write a business plan is not a TikTok video. I wish it was. <laughs> um, and it wasn't even a YouTube video, but it, it was like 490 pages written by Gordon Bell. And Gordon Bell is this fantastic guy. He was the founder of DEC. He was the chief, chief, uh, chief architect, chief technical officer. And I think he's a fellow now at Microsoft. And, and just, just an incredible, incredible guy. And so anyways, uh, and he started, he started Arden Computer, and, and then I met some amazing people at Arden Computer, John Rubenstein for one. And, and so anyways, uh, he wrote a book on how to, start, how to build a company, how to start a company. And it was like 490 pages or something like that. And, and if I would have read the whole book, there's no way NVIDIA would be in business today. <laughs> and so I, 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 I glanced through it, read, you know, kind of skimmed through it, and tried to write my business plan. Uh, the, truth, the truth be told, NVIDIA never finished the business plan because I never could finish it. And, and uh, I'm not really even too sure how to finish one today. And, and so, so um, I do remember this. Our, our VC, Sequoia Capital and Sutter, uh, incredible venture capitalist, uh, they, they asked for a business plan. And so we put a business plan together. And, and uh, uh, I could tell you that our forecast was off by so much. It, 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 I think, I think I could imagine guessing. Um, no, there's no way to guess even worse than that. And so, so we were off by so much. Nobody would have expected the market to be this large. Uh, nobody would have expected uh, our company to have taken so long to, to have gotten off the ground and for the CEO to take so long to figure it out. And so all of that stuff was, was um, uh, really, really hard to predict. Uh, and so, so your question is probably, why are we here? <laughs> so I, I hope I can figure that out tonight. NVIDIA is a great company, and yeah. uh, for those who I haven't met yet, uh, my name is Renee. I've been working at NVIDIA. Oh, did, I was going to give them an advice. Oh, yes. Just Go get ahead. to it. Yeah. <laughs> Just get to it. Yes, great advice. Um, I've been working at NVIDIA for coming up seven years, and I lead 2,000 healthcare AI startups that are in our inception program. Renee so, is amazing. Thank you, Jensen. Um, NVIDIA is a fantastic place to work. So for those who may not know a lot about NVIDIA, um, NVIDIA is actually not built like many of the large organizations in the industry with no regular P&L, no business units like many others you can see in um, Google or Microsoft and others. And uh, it's an extremely flat organization. Um, between me and Jensen, there's only three other um, executives in between. So it's very, very flat. And there's no org chart. We are volunteers that reports to mission. Um, and many people think we're a graphics company or a gaming company, but NVIDIA is actually a full stack company for all industries you can think of. Retail, finance, oil and gas, manufacturing. And more interestingly, we are a fabless semiconductor company, a cloudless cloud company, a manufacturing company that don't have our own manufacturing. Jensen. That sounds like a company I want to join. I just don't. Right? <laughs> <laughs> How did I, you I just think the expectation tonight is way too high. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that could very well be the wisdom you take away. You know, there, there, there is, there is, a, there is a, a belief that CEOs are, are extraordinary, amazing, um, really knowledgeable, really skilled people. And, and that's just not true. It is not true. 
we're not incompetent, you know, um, uninformed, uh, really super lazy people either. I, I, I just want, I don't want you to think that either. Um, however, however, uh, I hope the one thing that I convey to you guys today is that, that in fact you probably have everything you need to be a great CEO and already. And, and, and uh, if there's anything that I, I um, inspire you to do tonight, it's just to go do it, but just don't start a graphics company. <laughs> but what was your question? How did um, I do it? It was more like, how did you decide on such a model for NVIDIA? There, there, th that question is so loaded, and, and um, <laughs> it's hard to answer. Uh, but, but let me tear it apart, OK? Let me tear it apart. Um, th there's, a, there's a part about what does the company do what does the company do, and for what reason it does it? That's a really, really hard thing to figure out. And you don't have to figure it out one day, um, or you, you, you have the feelings for it, but you don't, how to, don't know how to put it into words. And the reason for that is because um, probably 30 years ago, the concept of cloud computing didn't exist. Um, uh, maybe 30 years ago, nobody would have believed artificial intelligence was possible, or accelerated computing was a thing. Uh, and so, so until it be, these words come into existence, it's okay that you don't have the words to describe it, but you need to know what does the company do and for what reason it does it. There's the second part, which is, which is um, uh, in what environment does this, the, the, does this company exist? What kind of environment is it? Is it a, is it a nurturing, stable environment? Uh, is it a hostile, volatile, dynamic environment? And because, because by understanding what environment your company is going to be in, i.e. the industry and the technology that governs it, the fundamental dynamics of the industry, by understanding some of these things, and that's the reason why if you're in the technology industry, having technical sensibility is really important. You can't be ignorant of the fundamental dynamics of the vehicle you're trying to build, you know, the fleet you're trying to build, the ship you're trying to build. And so understanding the fundamental dynamics of the industry is really important. Now, based on those dynamics, it causes you to think about how to architect this machine, this machinery. This machinery is essentially what NVIDIA is. NVIDIA is a machine that builds a bunch of other machines that, you, that other people would call products. And so, but it's a machine, and this machine has to be architected in a thoughtful way. That is the fundamental job of the CEO. And then the next part of it is how do you operate this machine? What are the rules that governs the, the, the operations of this machine? Because there will be many conflicting requirements of this machine. And this machine will be dealing with all of those conflicts in a really distributed way because you can't possibly be go governing everything overnight all, all by yourself. And so you have to empower amazing people like Renee to be able to do some of these things. And so what are the values that you encode in all of the people that you empowered? What are the principles by which they operate? What are the, what are the operating manual, if you will, of, of this machine? And some people call that culture. Uh, some, people, some people say those are procedures and processes and best, best known methods. There are a lot of ways to describe some of these things. But basically, is what is, what is this thing that we're doing? For what does it do and for what reason? Um, what is the architecture of the machine and why? And then how do you operate it? In, in a very large sense, all CEOs have to work those things out. Now, the thing that I optimized for is our industry, at some point, at, for, for, for the vast majority of my computer industry experience, it's been largely governed by Moore's Law. And, but we knew that Moore's Law was going to run out of steam. And at some point, the type of problems you want to solve are and in our case, the type of problems we want to solve are the ones that either Moore's Law can't solve or in the, in the time of Moore's Law, it's barely possible. And so we came up with this way of doing something called accelerated computing. Well, our world requires deep invention and a lot of discovery that hasn't been done before because we're the only company that's done it. And so you, you, you don't know exactly what the recipe is. You don't know exactly what the framework's going to be. You don't know exactly how to go do that. And so you, we architected a company that optimizes for a lot of innovation to happen, uh, optimizes for a lot of agility to happen. So for example, if we discovered, hey, this is a great new path. This is going to work. We could swarm the company towards it. We could shift the company, pivot the company to it. 
And to be able to do that, you need a company that allows you to do it. And this is, these are some of the things that you'll learn as you operate large companies, is that the, the CEO needs to create a system that allows the CEO your will or the collective will of the organization to change the course of the company. How do you do that? How do you change the course of a company? At NVIDIA, I can change the course of the company, of course, with the support of all of my, you know, all of the leaders that work there and all the amazing people that helped me realize that we need to change the course of the company. But I can change the course of a company within an email over a weekend. No large organizations have to change. You don't have to change your reporting structure. You don't have to change your boss. You don't have to change your office. You, and these days, you don't have to change where you live because you're working at home. And so, so we create an, an architecture for the company that allows for maximum agility in the event we discover something great. Uh, we also invented a company that allows us to create a new, new type of computing. And if you want to create a new type of computing, everything, nothing exists. And you have to create everything from scratch. So everything from the from the architecture of the chips to the way the chips are designed to the way the systems are built and the system software that runs on it and the algorithms that runs on it. And even more than that, the applications or the industries that use it all had to be invented from scratch. And so here we are sitting in the middle of nowhere. You know, we were in Fremont, we had three people. And we're imagining this new world and everything from computer graphics to, you know, scientific computing would be solved. And how would you go about creating a company that has such an influence um, across the entire stack and such influence across the entire industry? And so that's the part that we had to go invent. And, and as a result, if you look at NVIDIA's architecture, the organization, um, and I show NVIDIA's org chart all the time, it just, doesn't, it, it just doesn't look like an org chart, it looks like a computer stack. And the company is actually architected like a computer stack. And so why would you do such a thing? Why would you build a machine, a, a machine, a company, a machinery, a company, this organization looks like a computer? Well, that's more sensible to me than to create a company whose architecture looks like the military. If you think about it for a second, business units, divisions, maximizing autonomy, but more importantly, what managers really want to do is maximizing accountability as if you really can control the outcome of your business. They hold you accountable. I think those are really quite antiquated ideas. They might work in some large companies, other companies, well, we're, we're not a small company either. Um, they might work in other companies, but I never felt that making somebody promise that they're going to do something will optimize the ability for them to do it. And because you know that I don't believe anybody should fail alone, just because somebody says, oh, I'll do a billion, whatever, a billion, whatever, and I promise to do it, I'll sign up for my compensation. If I do better than that, I'll pay more than that. I do less than that, I'll do, get paid less than that. And they sign up for that. It, that doesn't give me any comfort at all. And, and because there are so many other people that depends on it, um, that should give nobody comfort. And so I decided to build an, a company that maximizing, maximizes for collaboration, uh, reuse of the things that we build, leverage, and as a result, we minimized, we didn't minimize, I guess, we, we probably diminished uh, the ability for somebody to say, hold somebody accountable through business units and financial results and divisions and autonomy and all of those things. Um, but it's just a different, a fundamentally different way of thinking about the architecture. And, and the, the way that I would, I would advise, and maybe the, the close with an advice, is that we always think about the problem we're trying to solve from first principles, and whether it's the, the, the company we're trying to build, um, the product we're trying to build, uh, or the organization we want to try to build, you have to go back to what is it that we are optimizing for? What do you want this machine to do? And what do you want the behavior of this machinery to be, this organization to be, in the event of external circumstances, changing circumstances? And so by doing that, we came up with the architecture we have today. Thank you, Jensen. That's very comprehensive. So you had mentioned some Moore's Law, interesting problems we're trying to solve. And so I want to touch upon NVIDIA's role in solving the world's greatest problems. So NVIDIA's technologies is involved in some pretty innovative projects from healthcare to sustainability and more. 
Some interesting projects include carbon capture AI, decoding of the COVID spike protein, speeding DNA sequencing uh, to a single day, predicting extreme weather. Can you tell us what are some of your favorite projects that NVIDIA is involved in? And are there any other projects that we should be aware of but may not have heard of yet? <laughs> Large language models. Funny you should ask. I wanted to share that with you all day. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote a list. <laughs> Let's see. Um, you, you know, the, the, I, I said earlier that it's great to have a company that does good business, but it's able to also make an impact. We do good business so that we can make an impact. That's, that should be the purpose of all companies. Business, making a lot of money, generating a lot of cash, um, creating a lot of value, it is, gives, you, gives you the opportunity to be able to do great things. Great things that otherwise would probably not get done. And so you mentioned a lot of good, a lot of good ones. I mean, the, the work that we do in, in uh, digital biology and healthcare, uh, you can't do without, without a company of our scale. And you have to be a company of our scale that's willing to uh, leverage a lot of the, the technology that we built for some other purpose to direct it and channel it at this really important cause. Because without us doing something like that, being clever about taking something that has a day job and channeling it towards uh, healthcare or climate science, uh, material sciences and other really important areas, without us doing something like that, um, this area of science would not be big enough to be able to support the level of investment that we put into it, the virtual investment that we put into it. And so, so that's, the, that's the, so part of the cleverness of the company to find ways to leverage what otherwise uh, has a day job playing computer games, but realize that the architecture with new, algor new algorithms is really fantastic at climate science. And so for us to adapt this platform in this way allows us to both drive a great business, but us also uh, drive great impact. And so that gives us a lot of pleasure. And, and when I mentioned earlier, a company with, with great business, but also a great sense of purpose, this is really at the, at the heart of that. And, so. and talking about well-run business, um, one of your favorite books is The Innovator's Dilemma. Uh, hopefully many of you guys have read that book. And the lesson learned that most people got from that book is that a well-run business can't afford to switch to a new approach that ultimately will replace the current business model until it's too late. And you mentioned actually on one of the VC panel at GTC a couple years back that NVIDIA almost went out of business seven times. Many people probably don't know that they turned the company around over and over and over again. Could you share with us that experience? And perhaps looking forward, what are some of the market indicators are you looking for to continue to time ahead of the market transitions? Mm -hmm. Well, the, the, in the beginning, in the beginning, we were just bad at our jobs. And, and I, 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 I just, you know, I don't know how else to say it. Uh, the first five years of our company, uh, t really talented people, uh, working super, super hard, um, but, but building a company is a new skill. It, there's no, no, nowhere in, in any books that would, would uh, properly describe uh, the circumstances that you, you're going to be in. Um, you're going to learn a lot about, about uh, both just building with so few resources, number one. Uh, number two, the immense resources of the competition you know, if, you're, if your company is $100 million large and your competitor's $10 billion large, you know it's possible for them to give away the product to keep you at zero. And so, and so the question is, is, how do you break into an industry that, that by the time that we showed up was relatively mature? And, and um, I, you know, it's hard to, to uh, tackle exactly one um, at the moment, but, but I, I think a lot of it has to do with, with simultaneously learning how to be a company, learning how to build products, a whole bunch of strangers coming together for the first time, um, uh, dealing with competition that is really quite immense, uh, trying to build a new product that the customer didn't even realize they wanted, uh, and um, uh, an ecosystem, an industry uh, that doesn't know how to value the product that you built. Um, uh, there's just the list of issues for a startup is just immense, and and um, I, you know I, I don't know that that there's there's um, 
uh, any code to, to share with you aside from uh, you've just got to get to it. And, and I, I think that, that um, uh, ignorance was not realizing it was impossible to do. You know, looking back at NVIDIA, I would say NVIDIA, building NVIDIA doesn't make sense. Um, the, fact that, the, the fact that we would build uh, one of the world's most important computing models, approaches, uh, in, in, the, in the world that we're in, um, and built up ecosystems all over the world from all of the industries that you've mentioned, uh, and being such a small company still, we're only 30, 28,000 people large, and, and you know how large um, the computer industry is, and many of the companies were one, a fraction of, of, um, of just about anybody's company. Uh, it, it's, it's kind of hard to imagine. And, and I, I think that, that the, the thing that, that um, uh, it never occurred to me that it wasn't possible when I was at your age. Uh, if you asked me to do it today, I would tell you <laughs> flat out it's not possible. Um, building the next NVIDIA is just not possible. And for a lot of reasons, I'll tell you it's not possible. But at the time, I didn't know that it wasn't that it was impossible, and that is your great gift. In a lot of ways, you know, I think I think um, you, you want to stay in that in that you know naive state for quite a long time. I don't mean naive and uninformed. You know, I was naive and constantly learning and constantly reading. Uh, some of my favorite books. Uh, one of them is Positioning. Uh, Al Rays, I think it is. Uh, is it Jack Trout, Al Rays? A really fantastic book. I, I make Positioning all the battle for your mind. Yeah, that's it. I, I read every single page of them. Please read the one that had the sidebar footnote that tells you years later what happened to those leaders in the making the decisions. We actually, NVIDIA learned a lot from that, like less is more and See, other I, things. I, I, I read that when I was in my 30s, and, and it, was, it was a really good book, and it, it taught me a lot. And the reason for that is because during a board meeting, during board meeting, one of, one of our amazing board members, Harvey Jones, he's asked me a simple question. He says, a really simple question. At the time, I had no idea how simple it was. It's just it was impossible for me to answer because I didn't understand it. And I was, I, was, uh, I was 30 years old at the time, and Harvey said, Jensen, how would you position this? Um, he wasn't asking about features and benefits. He was asking, how would you position this? You know, where in the world would you, how, where in the mind, in the context of the ecosystem, in the context of competition, how would you position this? Now, that, it, was, it was a simple question. The answer is supremely deep. You'll spend your whole career answering that question. Um, but the sooner you realize that that question exists, the sooner you realize that that question exists, the better off you're going to be. And so my question is, you know, whatever, whatever idea you want to start, uh, partly is what does it do, um, but partly how are you going to position it? And so if you start answering that question today, that'd be great. So you mentioned some of the headwinds that NVIDIA has overcome. And so I want to pivot to over the short-term outlook of the tech industry. Uh -huh. So a lot of MBA students choose to come to Haas because of its strong role in tech and tech recruiting. However, in recent months, the tech industry has been hit hard with massive layoffs announced across almost all major tech companies. NVIDIA has not and will not, has not announced any. <laughs> I have to be careful what I say. <laughs> I have to be careful what I say. <laughs> Has not announced it. <laughs> wow, the students. Boy the, boy, the electricity in the room changed. <laughs> While the students in the crowd are afraid to admit, but many MBAs. There, there was a nervous. I, and the CEO had a nervous laugh. <laughs> and his eyes became, became shifty. <laughs> he started moving about in his chair. <laughs> so many of the MBA students are afraid he of admitting. became less animated. <laughs> Generally more, more, more reserved. OK, go ahead. I'm sorry. What was your question? Sorry right? about that. I didn't. Um, so many MBA students here are afraid to admit, but they are to nervous. Say we're, in your, we're in our quiet period. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> we are in our quiet period. So many of the students here are nervous about their employment prospects. What are your thoughts? Wow. <laughs> this question is going to be hard to answer. Go ahead. What is it? I'm what, not, we're not hiring. 
What are your thoughts on the recent headwinds in the tech industry? And do you have any advice for current MBA students who were once considering the tech industry and maybe having second thoughts? No, the tech industry is great. <laughs> These questions are so compound, don't you guys think? <laughs> and ambiguous. Um, uh, the tech industry is fantastic. I, I don't know uh, what could be a more important industry in the future. Uh, and the reason for that is because it influences so many industries. You could argue w NVIDIA is in the pure tech industry. Um, there are some, some tech companies that are in the internet services industry. Um, obviously, they're not in healthcare or they're not in forestry or they're not, you know, so on, so manufacturing or so on and so forth. Um, but we are in the pure tech industry. And, and uh, I can tell you that the pure tech industry, industry is incredible. Uh, and the reason for that is because, because um, uh, obviously, uh, it's at the core and foundation of everything that every single industry and every industry is going to be a tech industry in the future to utilize the technology we create. And so I, I love the work that we do. Um, uh, the environment is challenging. It's very tough. The environment is very tough, obviously. And, and their, their, their friends that have been laid off, their, their colleagues that have been laid off, their you know, uh, uh, spouses that have been laid off. And, and so, so, so it's, it's tough out there. Uh, but it will pass. The size of the tech industry is one-tenth of what it's going to be, um, one-hundredth of what it's going to be. And so, so I think, I think uh, this is one of the most, most vibrant industries in the world, most exciting industries in the world, and most impactful. And so I, I would encourage all of you to consider it. And um, I, with respect to the, the uh, advice in the near term, uh, you've, you've got to be resilient to be great. There's one thing, you know, there, 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 there are a lot of ways you could describe me, um, but resilient has to be on top of that list. I've seen a lot of tough things, and, and the company has been on its back uh, multiple times, as Renee said. Uh, and um, uh, we have challenges from, from, uh, uh, from the environment, from the, from the, from the uh, uh, economy, from competition, from all, all kinds of places. And, and um, uh, but but you you just have to you know keep a positive outlook and uh, and uh, just keep you know walking past it. Uh, I'm always moving forward. You know I'm not ever moving forward too fast, uh, but I'm always always moving forward. And and um, uh, you know people ask me how how hey how's your day? You know and I I usually say good enough. Uh, a lot of people say incredible. Um, it's not incredible, <laughs> but it's good enough. It's good enough for, for me to want to keep on going every, every day, and, and um, uh, I'm, I'm loving it plenty much, and um, I wish it was better some days. Some days it's better than I thought it would be, um, but it's all good enough. And, and I think this, this even-keeled attitude, resilience towards um, uh, into the future uh, has really has really served NVIDIA well. And, and we, have, we have leaders in our company uh, that have been there for a very, very long time, uh, 30 years. Uh, you know, I, I've been there for 30 years, and there are others that have been there for 30 years. And, and my, my hope is that we work together for as long as we shall live. This, this attitude about building companies instead of uh, revolving doors and somebody makes a mistake or misses a quarter and poof, they're out, or they miss a commitment, poof, you know, they're out. Um, uh, I think that that way of building a company is, is, is really not very productive and it's not very long-term minded. And, and I, I, um, I, I, my, my advice to you guys is, is uh, this, it, you know, it's a bad year. Um, it's not going to be the only bad year that you're ever going to enjoy. Uh, and um, I, I can't even tell you this is going to be the worst year. Um, but your attitude should be, it doesn't matter. Your Thank you. Should be. It doesn't matter. Thank you, Jensen. Okay. Would you be willing to take some questions from our incredibly yeah. resilient uh, students <laughs> and community? Yeah, yeah. So, sorry about that. So, okay. um, some of you, if you'd like to ask a question, uh, can you please go to the mic in the back of the room and identify yourself? And remember to make it not a compound question, but <laughs> a simple one question would be great. 
Hi, Jensen. Hi. My name's Garv. I'm an undergraduate here, majoring in electrical engineering, computer science, and business. Yeah. And um, my father's been working at NVIDIA for five years. Uh, he's been a senior compiler verification engineer yeah. uh, with CUDA. So I oh, thought that fantastic. was pretty interesting. And maybe a bit on the nose, but understanding a bit about my dad's job prospects. I keep thinking about um, the future of CUDA. I wonder if the trend we see in other industries where we're moving towards like um, much more specialized chips, is the death of the general purpose, uh, general purpose GPU coming? Will we see a move away from CUDA into things like FPGAs to run all of those things like healthcare, um, ML, AI? Where is the future of CUDA in this? Uh, there's a, there's a, a tension between general purposeness and acceleration. General purposeness has the benefit it does everything, obviously, but it does everything poorly. Acceleration has the benefit of doing something incredibly well, maybe a thousand times better, but it can only do one thing. And you know, in, inside a computer, you can't just do one thing. You don't just run one thing. And so the question is, um, how do you, and, and if you only do one thing, that one thing's market size is only so big. And if that one thing's market size is only so big, you can only invest so much in it. So for example, if the market size is $100 million for that one thing, how much can you possibly invest in that $100 million? Less than $100 million. But if you, have, if you have the ability to do more than one thing, say, let's say it's still acceleration, but it's 100 things. And they just seem, they, they share a lot of characteristics. By aggregating 100 things in multiple domains, maybe it's fluids, maybe it's particles, okay? Maybe it's beams, maybe it's rays, maybe whatever it is, whatever the domain is, okay? Um, if you could aggregate a lot of these, then your investment ability is gonna be much greater. Makes sense, right? However, it's a really slippery slope. If you become completely general purpose, then you're not good at anything anymore. And so we created a model, a computing approach called accelerated computing, where these two chips come together. The compute, CUDA is about part of the work being done on a CPU, part of the work being done on, on, on the GPU, on CUDA. And so the ability for us to spread that work and use the right processor for the right job and still be able to engage, um, solve the needs of sufficiently large markets, our ability to invest is going to be greater, the technology can advance greater, so on and so forth. Does it make sense? So this is the fundamental tension that you described, and this is the, uh, the essence of almost everything that we do. Sounds Thank good. You. Glad to yeah. hear my dad will still have a job. He's going to have a great job. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Jensen. Hi. My name is Nebo, uh, nice. EW student here. Thanks for being here. I think it's, speaking for everybody here, it's great to have a CEO of a company that's making a global impact. Um, talking to us, so really appreciate you being here. So I think my question is, so at a manager at your level, um, your scope goes cuts across finance, marketing, technology, et cetera, et cetera. At your level, how do you manage to keep a high level view of where, where the company is going, where the industry is going, and also get into the details of like, this technology, um, what what innovations you guys need, um, people, people strategy, thinking through lay, layoffs or not, not laying people off, stuff like that. How do you you know, balance your time out so that you have a high level of view, but also like get in the weeds of um, the work your, your teams are doing. All of our doing. best leaders, all of our best leaders are deep and wide. You don't have to be the deepest and you don't have to be the widest, but you're deep and wide. And so you, the only way to do so is one, to have deep interest in the work of others. You really want to make, be able to make a difference. You have to have the attitude, and I have the attitude, that if I'm sitting with the finance team, I can make a contribution in finance. If I'm sitting in le with the legal team, I can make a contribution in, le in, in legal, our legal activities. If I'm sitting with HR, I can make a contribution with HR, and I'm sitting with the architects, I can make a contribution with the architects, and I'm sitting with our research team, I can make a contribution to our research team. You've gotta believe that, you have to strive for that. You can't always necessarily contribute as much as you like, but you really have to strive for that. As a CEO, you just have to strive for that. Now, the best leaders in our company all can do that. They're all quite broad in their understanding of, of, um, of the issues at hand, and that just takes experience. You know, just after you work for a long time, uh, if you stay with the company for a long time, you're gonna learn how things work. Uh, I don't believe in the 10 year, 10 year tenure, you know. Uh, I believe that you're just barely figuring it out after 10 years, hopefully they give you another 20, 30 years. And so I, I think, I think the, the, the dedication to the craft matters. Being CEO, being a leader, being an entre entrepreneur, it's a craft. It's no different than cooking, it's no different than gardening, it's a craft. 
and you have to decide to dedicate yourself to the craft. And so, so I, I, think, I don't think there's any easy answer aside from that, uh, but you have to have curiosity, you have, you have deep empathy for other people's work. You have to really, genu I genuinely care for the success of my uh, engineering team, my business team, my marketing team, my HR team, my finance team. I genuinely care for their success. And I genuinely believe that I can bring some perspective to help them today. And so that's the way to do it. Thank you. Hi, Jensen. I'm Grant, a part-time EW student uh, working in sustainability, and was just really inspired to hear your part about um, you know not just benefiting shareholders, but also society and having impact. That's huge for us at Berkeley. Um, I guess in, in, in that line, I also saw in your CSR report, you know, a lot of the things you discussed about climate modeling, et cetera, really inspiring. And I guess also being in the field, I noticed that with y'all being innovators, kind of like AMD and other competitors, uh, they've also set a really high bar in this impact space in terms of product energy efficiency, right? Kind of at the, the heart of what you do every day. I think AMD is like a, tw a 30 by 25 goal for 30 times energy efficiency improvement in their chips and has set an SBTI target for climate change, model scope three. And I was wondering, maybe some of those things are coming in your next CSR report, but you know, I guess maybe give a taste of where you see this ESG field and kind of your impact going, you know, probably to the heart of your business, kind of like AMD and others. Just wonder if you could speak to that for a bit. I, I can't speak on their behalf. Uh, they're doing a lot of great things, and, and it's, it's a great company. And they, they, um, uh, they have excellent people, and, and we enjoy working with them. Uh, our approach is really very different. Um, our approach goes, our approach is not just about building chips that we hope somebody would use to solve climate science. Our approach isn't to build chips that we hope somebody would buy from a computer company that would then someday translate to um, discovering some material. Our approach is engaging the science and doing basic research on the science itself. We're, we're, I, th I think the only pure tech company that has climate research scientists, roboticists, um, people who are doing uh, fundamental work in digital biology, uh, you name it. And so we engage the science directly, we do basic research, and we find a way to make a contribution in a way that nobody in the industry is currently doing. And so, so that's, that's our approach. Um, I, I think it's much more direct, uh, much more intentional, um, and much less passive. The idea that we would just build chips and somebody would use it for um, discovering the next great breakthrough that leads to a Nobel Prize, because we're a computer company, I would just have to say no duh. If we absolutely don't care about it at all and we just make chips, that will obviously happen because we're in the computer industry. You could say that if you're a DRAM company. Um, but we, we, uh, we, we decided uh, fairly early, early on that we would engage the science very directly and we have some amazing research that comes out of our company. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Hi, I'm Andrea Hayden Lawanig and I currently work under Renee as a high school intern. Yay, good job. Um, so yeah. Um, and I just wanted to thank you for all your insightful information that you shared with me today. And all the, although there's economic downturn right now, you still supported myself and the nine other Cristo Rey students that NVIDIA sponsors from Cristo Rey High School. So I just wanted to thank you for all the opportunities you've given me, and as well as getting leadership from Renee as don't, well. Don't let his question scare you. <laughs> um, but because I'm going to like college soon, um, I just wanted to know what are some of the opportunities that you experience now that you wish you would have witnessed beforehand um, that helped shape you become the person you are today? I can only tell you the great piece of advice I got when I was growing up. Be a doctor. <laughs> um, uh, also, also uh, uh, and, and, and he's absolutely right. You know, my father was absolutely right. Be a chemical engineer. Uh, because chemistry is always important. Uh, it just that was just it wasn't my path. It wasn't because they were wrong. They're perfectly good careers. It just wasn't my path. And and um, I, you you just got to figure out your path. Uh, where where do I think the next amazing revolution is going to come? And this is going to be flat out one of the biggest ones ever. And and so I told you I was going to tell you, and I'm going to tell you. And and there's no question that digital biology is going to be it. For the very first time in our history, in human history, biology has the opportunity to be engineering, not science. When something becomes engineering, not science, it becomes less sporadic and exponentially improving. It can compound on the benefits of the previous
previous years. And every company's contribution, every researcher's con contributions compound on each other. For the very first time, we know how to represent biology, understand the language of biology. We can represent the language of chemistry. It's never happened before. And I could, I could, I'm very proud to say that NVIDIA is you know, at the center of all of that. And we've made it possible for some of this breakthrough to happen. And now we're going to have incredible tools uh, that brings the world of biology, which is very chaotic and random, um, uh, or not random, but very chaotic and constantly changing and very diverse and complex, obviously, and bring it into the world of computer science. And that is going to be profound. And so if you happen to, to, happen to love this intersection, I think it's going to be rich with opportunities. It's going to be a giant industry. Great. Thank you so much. Hey, Johnson. Thank you so hey. much for your time today. I'm Thank Nihal. You. I'm a first year undergrad here at Haas. Um, cool. So it's an exciting time right now for autonomous vehicles, particularly for NVIDIA's business um, with Mercedes and their L3 approval. So I just wanted to ask you how you're thinking about prioritizing the autonomous business over the next 10 years yeah. relative to other segments. Our strategy is not to build a self-driving car only, but our strategy is to enable the entire world to make everything that moves be fully autonomous or partly autonomous. And so the, the way we approach this problem is to try to understand, first of all, what does an autonomous computing computer look like? And we built the world's first robotics computer. It's called Xavier, and it was the first robotics computer ever made. And it was very odd, and it was sensor-rich, and the type of processing it does. Very common sense now, but at the time, it looked very different than a personal computer. It looked very different than, a, than an iPhone, for example. So the computer chip um, uh, was something that we said, okay, well, it's going to be a new type of processing, new type of algorithms. It's going to take a new type of computer, and we built that. The second thing that we did was we built the entire software stack to go figure out what are the algorithms that it would take to um, sense what's happening in the environment, uh, perceive its environment, reason about where it is and where it wants to go, and then take the, take the appropriate actions and plans to get there. And so that, that, that robotic stack, um, we started to build it so that we understand better. It's very different than Windows and Excel. It's a robotic stack that, that is real time and safety is involved and uh, its ability to reason about where it is and perceive where it is is really important. And so that computing stack had to be invented, so we started working on that. And then, of course, developing software for a robot is very different than software for Excel and other things. You can't program it into existence. You have to use this technique called machine learning. So you have to build a computer that constantly learns from examples to write software by itself. That's called deep learning. And so using, using a computer to automatically write software with our coaching and our guidance um, to write a piece of code that would then ultimately run on this computer requires a data center and a whole bunch of new tools. And we went and built that. And then, of course, all of this is great. Um, we have to go find partners that we can work with to build the cars with them. And then secondarily, we open up the platform so that if you want to buy our chips, terrific. If you want to buy our chips and algorithms, terrific. If you want to use the, the operating system, terrific. Or you just want to use our uh, Omniverse uh, virtual world simulator so that you can do synthetic data generation and test your robot in this virtual world, fantastic. However you want to do it, it's fantastic. And so we opened up the platform, and we've got customers working with us in all these different, different areas. Our goal, our fundamental goal, notice the strategy I just described, the work that we did, the strategy I just described, reflects the vision that we started with, which I, in the beginning I said, what is your vision? What are we trying to do? Well, let's not just build a self-driving car. We could do more than that for the world. Let's go build a computing platform end-to-end, -end, full stack, so that Everybody in the world who wants to build anything that's autonomous that moves can. So if you're Caterpillar, if you're Komatsu, if you're a little Neuro, if you're RoboTaxi, if you're, you know, commercial car, a shuttle, a bus, we got stuff all over that. And so, so that's, it makes, it, makes everything, uh, it makes everything safer. Things that are autonomous never, never lose concentration. Um, of, of course, the, the technology is hard, um, but um, uh, our, our approach reflects our vision. Okay, thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Jensen. Yeah, you're welcome. Hi, my name is Simeon. I'm a first year EW MBA student. You talked about the importance of adaptability in architecture and like your ability to be able to change the course of the company over the weekend in email. I was wondering if you could speak at all to any downsides to adaptability and how it might compromise quality of a product. Yeah, there's, there are two systems, really good. There are two systems that every company needs to have. In the beginning, in the beginning of a startup, I would recommend you're mostly adaptive. Agility is your only, only instrument. And the reason for that is because there are too many unknowns. 
to set up some kind of a rigid organization with org charts and empires for people to protect and organizations and people they have to go protect and you know they talk about my people my people this my people that as if they people belong to them it, you know it's it, it, you don't you want to avoid that as long as you can but at some point the machinery that you create needs to be systematic and consistent as well and the reason for that is because customers need to re, need to re depend on you there's you know in our in our company's case uh, it's, our product is not the final product our product has a whole bunch of other products built on top of it and and, and with it and so they, they've got their plan and they need to be able to, 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 to uh, depend on us time in and time out. And so that execution machine is real important. So the company you, you want to build at some point evolves to essentially having an execution engine that's incredible and an innovation engine that's adaptable. And you have to find a way to create these two systems. It's no different than most computers have these days. There are parts of the computer that's real time, isochronous, and there's parts of the computer that's you know, interrupt driven, best effort, okay? And so not everything in the computer need, can be isochronous and always continuously running. Um, and not part, you can't have everything being interrupt driven as well. And so, but you need to have both. Thank you. Um, Hi, Jason. My name is Kai. I'm a first year EWM MBA student. And you mentioned that you have two great kids and a great dog and a great wife. You're comfortable with where you work. So I'm wondering, you know, what make you make the final decision to switch? I feel it's very hard, especially when we are already feeling comfortable, you know, make good money and you had to sacrifice, give up everything else and make a switch. And is it because you truly believe your friends, you know, envision a good team, or you already envision a good technology or just because a random Tuesday? Uh, I believed in them and I believed in myself to be able to build something. And now the question is at the time, do we, do we really, has, has our vision about what we're gonna build, did it really manifest? The answer is not really. But I believed in them and I believed in myself. Um, I also believe that, that even though we had a, you know, we had a family and, and our kids were young, young, they were just one and two, uh, we had a lot of responsibility and we were young parents and um, I, I could say that, that um, uh, that could cause us to be quite risk averse, uh, but I was never I was never concerned about being able to do something else if it didn't work out, and so I felt like I wasn't risking anything, and and uh, maybe that's too maybe that's too too um, uh, uh, too careless by 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 some other standards, um, but I really believed in it. I I believe that we weren't you know putting our family in harm's way, and uh, if things don't work out, uh, you know there'll be an even better job for me somewhere someday. And so, so I, on the one hand, uh, the opportunity to do something great with uh, people that I, I really respected and, and, and uh, uh, respected and loved to this day, uh, and uh, confidence that we'll be able to do something great and, you know, not really feeling like we're losing anything. And we were young, you know, Lori and I were young, and, um, I, you know, so, so it, was, it, it wasn't a decision that was so, so difficult per se. It was probably even a, you know, Less than a less than a dinner conversation, and maybe even less than that. You know, it, and so so I I think um, uh, all of you are all of you are young and bright, and uh, there's so much opportunity out there. I, I I genuinely don't believe that that you're when you make a decision to to, to start a company or join a startup. Uh, frankly, I, I I don't think it's it's a horrible you know horribly difficult life decision. Um, the the only thing that really matters is is. Um, uh, in, in my estimation is, are you going to love the people that you work with? Are you going to love the work that you're going to do? Um, are you, are you going to love it so much that all the pain and suffering that's going to come your way, which I promise you will be lots, uh, the pain and suffering and the setbacks um, and the disappointments, uh, the, the list of bad days, uh, I, you know, if, if you were to pile them all together into one uh, moment for me, uh, like Renee was trying to do earlier, you know the, the seven seven times you almost went out of business and piled it onto one instance. You know you 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 might blow up, um, but and and so but don't do that. That's why I didn't answer it. Um, it's <laughs> it, it, it's it's too painful. And um and, and so you you as you know, uh, uh, great athletes and great achievers all have this one characteristic. They have the ability to forget the last moment. That was the last point. That was the last down. That was the last, you know, whatever. Just that was the last game. The ability to forget, and and I, boy, I got to tell you, I got I've got incredible ability to forget. <laughs> and so you just got to let the past be the past, 
um, and that helps you with your resilience. Um, and so long as you love the work that you do, you'll be able to keep on carrying on. And that's, that's really it. That's 100% of the wisdom. Thank you. Thank you so much. One more question. Yeah, I'm happy. I'm, I'm, here. I'm here all night. I'm here all night. <laughs> I made you guys wait. That's the punishment. When you're, when you're, late, when you're late in business, you've got to earn your way back in. Uh, hi, Jensen. This is Dave. Uh, I'm a master's in financial engineering student at Haas. Um, thank you for the great session. Um, thank you. It's been super interesting and helpful for us. So NVIDIA is like a market leader for AI processing. And ChatGPT is, is going super viral in the past three to six months. Uh, there's a lot of speculation in the market to what it could potentially be for the semiconductor industry in general. But would love to be hearing what's your take on like NVIDIA's long-term sustainability and what do you think about ChatGPT as a technology? Yeah, again, there's a lot of different questions in there, uh, but I'll, I'll, tear it, I'll tear it apart. Sorry, uh, yeah. first, first of all, uh, ChatGPT is, is a very, very big deal. Just think about it. Um, in, in just a few days, right, handful of days, it has now reached uh, tens of millions of people. It's not, I think it's more than five, it's probably less than 30. Um, and, and the amazing thing is this, everybody's using it for different reasons and everybody finds it delightful. That's its miracle. When was the last time that we saw a piece of technology that is so versatile that it can solve problems and surprise people in so many ways so often? It can write poem, of course. It can write, um, you know, it can, well, you guys shouldn't use it yet. Um, <laughs> not, unless, not unless you get permission. Um, it could, it could, uh, it could uh, fill out a spreadsheet. It could, it could do a SQL query. It could, it could write a SQL query and then do, do a SQL query. Uh, it could um, uh, write Python code, as you know. It could write Verilog, you know. And so if you can't do it today, of course, it'll be able to do it someday. And so, so the, the fact that, that you have this tool that can do all these different things has really, has really, surprised a lot of people around the world. Now, for, for a lot of people uh, in the industry that have been working on this, we've been waiting for this moment. This is the iPhone moment, if you will, of artificial intelligence. This is the time when all of the big ideas about mobile computing and all that, it all came together in a product that everybody just kind of, I see it, I see it. I can now use this as an API and I connect it to a spreadsheet, I connect it to PowerPoint, I connect it to a drawing program, I connect it to a photo editing program. It'll make everything better. It'll make everything better. Um, and so, so we, we now know uh, that this is going to be a monumental impact on technology. And now the question is, is um, uh, how quickly would the technology diffuse? And I, I think that, that um, uh, the last 60 days uh, kind of tells us something. The rate of technology diffusion could be quite high. Uh, for example, uh, since ChatGPT came out, probably some 500 startups have already happened. And not only that, in about two weeks' time, they created applications that are really delightful and useful. In a couple of weeks' time. This is no different than when browsers were created and somebody, boom, overnight, created, you know, wrote JavaScript and bam, you've got a website that's really quite surprising. You know, or uh, a, um, uh, when the iPhone came out and all of a sudden somebody wrote something, took about a couple of weekends and bam, they have a piece of software they can download from the App Store. And, you know, before you know it, it's something like Spotify. You know, it's pretty amazing, right? And so, so these kind of, this is, this is going to happen now. This is, I, I think that's a foregone conclusion. Uh, the thing that's really exciting to me is that, that this, this basic technology can now be applied to a whole bunch of other industries that have never enjoyed the benefit of technology. Think about this, this idea. For the last 40 years, for the entire 40 years that I've been in the industry, we have done nothing but make computers harder and harder for people to program. And that's why the technology divide has been so large. And the technology divide is getting larger and larger, except till one day. All of a sudden, everybody can program a computer. Literally ev everyone can program a computer. We have democratized computing. It doesn't matter if you're a farmer, a doctor, a nurse, a frontline worker, um, assistant, a travel agent, it doesn't matter. A small business, a restaurant owner, it doesn't matter. Everybody is now a programmer, isn't that right? You just have to prompt this thing to write a program for you, to do something for you, automate something for you. We have, we have just, we have done, you know, what, what OpenAI has done and what the team over there has done genuinely is one of the greatest things that, that, that has ever been done for computing. 
we have democratized computing in a very, very large way. And so I'm very, very excited about that. That's, and so I'm, I'm, I'm excited about the, the prospects of it, of course, as you can tell. Um, now the question is how, how is it going to impact um, uh, uh, healthcare? How is it going to impact transportation? How is it going to impact uh, retail, logistics? How is it going to impact manufacturing? Uh, the other hundred trillion dollar industry that is today largely not served by technology. Computing industry is tiny compared to the world's industry. It's like a hundred trillion dollars. It's giant. And so we could do something now. Thank you. Yep. Hi, Jensen. Uh, thank you for talking to us tonight. Um, I'm Eric, a uh, French business student. All right. That's so. Okay. I'll, I'll stand here afterwards because I, I, you know, so they can turn off the lights and I'll, I'll, I'll just, I'll answer the rest of your questions. I owe it to you. So, um, yeah, I wanted to know what was, in your opinion, your biggest mistake and how did you overcome it in your uh, business life? I, yeah, I, I, I don't want to disappoint you, but, but um, the number of mistakes that I've made is so many uh, that it's hard for me to, to really say, wow, you're the champion. <laughs> um, and, and the reason for that is right now, as you're asking the question, um, you know, if you don't make that many mistakes, then the one kind of stands out. Do you know what I'm saying? If you make mistakes all the time, you're going to have a hard time picking one out. <laughs> I'm kind of loving all of them. <laughs> you know, I, I love all my children. And, and they're, they're because, because, you know, when it's a success, it's somebody else's success, but it's a mistake, it's yours. Okay, and, and so uh, I've made, I've made um, uh, uh, strategy mistakes. However, it led to something really great. Um, I've made uh, execution mistakes. Uh, however, um, uh, I learned more deeply about the craft, which then led me to become a better, um, better uh, at, at managing that. Um, I've made, uh, um, uh, walked away from business I shouldn't have. I've taken business I shouldn't have. I uh, don't, so I'm not exactly sure uh, what I learned from either one of those, okay? And so, so I, I think the list, the list, the, the only thing that I would tell you about, about that is, is uh, you have to learn how to estimate, es estimate uh, opportunity cost. Um, one of the things that most people don't do very well is estimating opportunity cost, only cost. Because when you look at your P&L, it doesn't ever describe opportunity cost. Is that right? Mm -hmm. It only describes the things that you, you did do and the cost it incurred as a result of that. It turns out most of life is about the things that, that you could have done, but you didn't have time to do. And, uh, and when you're the CEO of the company, uh, the company's resources, that's, your, that's, that's what you manage. And it's really important not to squander that. And Rene has, has heard me say it a hundred times that my fundamental job is to create the conditions by which the company succeeds and do their best work and selecting uh, projects that are worthy of our company, and and um, uh, that's really about about you know what to choose and what not to choose, and what not to choose is really really important because it, it, you know, we only have twenty eight thousand people, and if you if you kind of loaded your plate with um, nothing but salad and fruit at the buffet line, you know when the when you walk up to that that ribeye is and that fried chicken is going to be tough, you know, and so you, you <laughs> okay that was just. To, CEO joke, CEO Very joke. So everybody's, everybody's going, but everybody here is vegetarian. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, all right. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you. So yep. um, uh, it's, I just want to give a huge shout out to Renee and to Ryan and especially to Jensen. Okay, the session's over, but I'll keep answering your question. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. 